Hi, welcome to Horror vs. Reality. I'm Anastasia, and with me as always is Morgan. Say hi, Morgan. Hi, Morgan. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Mo, it's been a minute. It has been a minute, and it's been a a really frustrating minute. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Well, before that, it had also literally been, like, a couple weeks since we recorded, so. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was looking back, and I was like, holy shit, it's been, like, two weeks. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. We, uh, we just didn't know when we could record until now, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so we've been, we've been busy. Um, so, today's episode is 2003's Memories of Murder. Versus the Hwasong. It's uh, Hwasong. Huh? Ha Hwasong ha murders? Okay. Yeah, that's the only word that I know I'll get right. Okay, Hwasong. <laughs> um, yeah, we're super sorry. We're woefully uh, not great at our Korean, um, despite my best friend of, like, 20 years being a Korean person. <laughs> Um, don't kill me, Yana. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> uh, Memories of Murder is directed by Bong Joon Ho. Ho. Bong Joon Ho? Bong sure. Joon Ho. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm trying, I swear. Okay, so, uh, he's long been celebrated in Korea. Um, Vong began to have international success with films such as Snowpiercer, uh, which stars well-known American actor Chris Evans, you know, uh, Captain America in the Marvelverse. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Okja, which was produced by Netflix. What was Okja? Um, I know it has some creature in it that looks kind of like a hippo. Oh, he did that? Yeah. What? I like that movie. Yep, he did that. Yep. Um, he, he did a bunch of films, actually. Uh, he also did Parasite. Yeah. Which was fantastic. If you haven't seen Parasite, go see Parasite. It's on Hulu if you live in America. Um, outside of America, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a great film. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture last year, and it was the first um, non-English speaking film to win the Best Picture Oscar. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so that's, like, pretty boss. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So this movie stars Kang Ho Song as Detective Park Duman. Uh, Song is a frequent collaborator with Bong, uh, starring in Memories of Murder, The Host, Snowpiercer, and Parasite. Um, And in 2020, the New York Times ranked him number six on its list of the 25 greatest actors in the 21st century. Nice. Yeah, and he's been voted Film Actor of the Year by Gallup Korea four times in 2013, 2017, 2019 and 2020. Damn. Yep, he is easily one of the most recognized faces in Korean cinema. Um, and then Kim Sang Kyung as Detective Sao Tae Yoon. Uh, Kim is probably best known for Memories of Murder and 2007's May 18. He is also a familiar face on the small screen, starring in period drama, uh, King Sejong the Great, as well as the sitcom What Happens to My Family? Question mark. Mm. Um, Roha Kim as Detective Cho Yong-Koo. Uh, like Kang Ho Song, Roha Kim has also collaborated with Bong several times in his first film, Barking Dog Never Bites, as well as The Host. He also won Best Actor in the 2001 Dong A Theater Awards for his portrayal of the Yonsen Gun of Yosin in the stage play Yi. I butchered that. I'm- <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jae Ho Song as Sergeant Shen Dong Chol. 
Uh, Song was born in 1937 in Pyongyang, now the capital of North Korea, and fled to South Korea during the 1953-1950, I mean the 1950-1953 uh, Korean conflict. After debuting as a voice actor in 1959 and appearing in a film for the first time in 1964, Song took leading and supporting roles in more than 120 films and TV dramas, notably 1975's Young Jaws, Hey Daz, which he perhaps is most well known for. Uh, sadly, yeah, Song passed. Yeah, well, no, um, I was about to say, sadly, Song passed away in November of last year. Aww. Yeah, of a chronic illness he had been battling for the better part of the year. Um, I don't know the disease exactly, but I can confirm it was not COVID related. Okay. So, Byun Hibong as Sergeant Ko Hibong. Uh, Byun began acting in the early 1970s, gaining praise for his role on the landmark police procedural chief inspector. Oh, this guy's 79. I'm sorry, I'm getting them mixed up. Okay. <laughs> this guy's 79. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Okay. He parlayed this notoriety into decades of successful character acting, um, beginning in 2000 with Barking Dog Never Bites. Pyon began a successful working relationship with Bong Joon-ho. He also went on to star in Memories of Murder, The Host, and Okja. So, I'm going to start with a summary of the film. Um, Morgan, what were your thoughts on the movie? It was wild. It was crazy. Like, kind of goofy in parts and then just ridiculous in parts. But I overall, I liked it. Yeah, and I mean, they were definitely exaggerating some things to kind of make the police look like buffoons. But at the same time, the police, like, really were that brutal. I know. And crooked. <laughs> They literally waterboarded someone yes. with spicy seafood soup. Yes! What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> that's fucking terrible. Yeah, that's got it. That's fucking wild. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Ugh, can you imagine like Red Hot? I mean, not the not the band Red Hot Chili Peppers, <laughs> but in your eyes. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> and yes. Coming out of your mouth and your nose and. You well, can imagine I, that? <laughs> I can't imagine it running out of my mouth and my nose as well. But I can't imagine it being in my eyes. Oh, because yeah. at a crawfish boil, I made the mistake after p unpeeling the crawfish of rubbing my eye. <sighs> and it was not a mild boil by oh, any man. stretch. Like, my, I thought my eyeball was just going to burst into flames. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Andrew and I cook with a lot of chilies, and I won't even go into any details of what happened to both of us several times. <laughs> Wash your hands, people. <laughs> it's important. Like, don't touch we're your gone. eyes or skin <laughs> yeah. if you've been touching peppers and shit. Like, yeah, you will just, hurt yourself. Just keep some gloves handy if you decide to cut up a fuck ton of chilies or chili paste. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> this has been a public service message. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to start the synopsis of the film. So it takes place in October 1986, and two women have been found raped and murdered on the outskirts of a small town, which is Haesong. Right? Haesong? Yeah. Haesong. Haesong. I was close, damn it. Haesong. <laughs> Haesong. That's what uh, Google Translate said, and okay. and I Googled how to pronounce it, and there's, like, a YouTube video about it, so I'm <laughs> only going off of that. You know what's really bad is I feel like I did look up the YouTube video of how to pronounce it and just completely <laughs> forgot it, because I probably looked it up stoned as fuck. Yeah, I kept saying hui sang. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that from how it looks. Yeah, hui, hui sang. I was like, okay. yeah, that's it. Awesome. Awesome. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So, um, local detective Park Du Man, not having dealt with such a serious case before, is overwhelmed um, 
evidence is improperly collected. The police's investigative methods are suspect, corrupt, and violent at times. And their forensic technology is near non-existent. Um, Park claims he has a way of determining suspects by eye contact. Like he's a fucking psychic or something. It's really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. He decides to first question a mentally disabled boy named Bok Kwong Ho because he used to follow one of the victims around town. Now, Park uses his eye contact method, thinking that Bok is responsible, and has his partner Cho beat a confession out of Bok. Not illegal at all, you know? <laughs> um, Sao Tae Yoon, a detective from Seoul, uh, volunteers to assist them. However, he and Park's methods clash. Like, these two guys are not fond of each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sal deems Bach's hands too weak to be able to commit such a crime, clearing his name after more murders are committed. And they realize that the killer waits until a rainy night and only kills women wearing red. Uh huh. Officer Kwan Puyak realizes that a local radio station is always requested to play a particular song during the nights the murders are committed. Now, at the latest crime scene, Park and Cho and So all arrive to investigate in different ways. When a local man nearly masturbates nearby, when a local man nearby masturbates into some woman's red lingerie, Park and Cho apprehend him and beat the fuck out of him. <laughs> yeah, and he's wearing women's panties. Yes. Um, you know, he has family at home, and he doesn't know where else to get his rocks off at. So, yeah. I know! His wife's, like, dying, and he has all those kids in the house, and they only have, like, a one-room house. I felt really bad for him. Yeah, he's like, I just want to masturbate, man, and I have nowhere to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Just go in the woods. <laughs> go to a public restroom in the stall. <laughs> I feel like that's somewhat better. I don't know. I don't know. Is it? What if you were, what if you had to go to the bathroom and you were like listening to some guy going like. (laughs) I know damn well that that men, when they put their mind to it, can be quiet during sex. (laughs) What about masturbation? I feel like you could be quiet during masturbation. It would be like. Can you hear that? You could totally quietly masturbate. Come on. I mean, girls can. Well, sure, but I feel like men definitely can. They don't have to make it sound whack, 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 whack. <laughs> <laughs> Write to us. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, don't Please do that. Don't. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm going to get some really obscene emails. If we to do that. Please don't tell me about how you whack off. I don't want to. Please, Sorry. no. Do not email me. <laughs> For the love of God, do not I'm email so me. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus, Morgan. Uh. <laughs> okay, fuck. Where was I in the story? Masturbation. <laughs> right. Guy masturbating in the woods. So they beat the fuck out of him, and uh, So found finds a survivor of the killer with Quan help. Now, upon learning that the killer's hands were noticeably soft, So clears the man. As his hands are rough. Infuriated that they lost their only suspect, Park scuffles with So until Quan alerts them that the song on the radio is playing. They realize it's raining, but arrive too late, finding another woman murdered. Park, So, and Cho finally decide to work together to get the case solved. Yeah. They now, were, like, uh, so against each other. Yeah, they fucking ha- Well, most of them hated each other. Yeah, they and, all got in fights all the time. Yeah, it was a very I, harmonious working environment. I will say that the, <laughs> what's the, um, he wasn't the, um, who's the guy that got hit with the, the board? Who is that guy? The first suspect? No, the, um. Okay, so. Clues leads them to a fact. And Park Chung Gu. So notes that his hands are soft, like the survivor I described. 
Now, Sean Goo begins to show discomfort when So presents the peaches, and they think that they've found the killer. Cho loses control and beats Sean Goo, prompting their superior to ban him from the interrogation room. Park and Cho listen to Bok's earlier confession. So points out that he talks as if someone else did it, and that he merely witnessed it. So they go to Bok's father's restaurant, only to discover a drunken Cho there. As people watch the news and ridicule police officers, he beats everyone up, and Bok joins in the fray, swinging a wooden board at Cho's leg and accidentally piercing it with a rusty nail. Parkins so chase Bok and question him, but he gets frightened and runs into the path of an oncoming train where he is struck and killed. <coughs> Park learns that Cho's leg will have to be amputated because the nail has caused tetanus, leaving him feeling guilty. But as we were talking about earlier, don't feel guilty. That dude totally fucking deserved that shit. Yeah, he was such a piece of shit. Yeah. He, like, beat up that guy with... I guess it's supposed to be Downs. I don't want to say the R word. Obviously. I just said he was mentally disabled. Yeah. Because they didn't specify what was happening to him. Yeah, and they just, like, beat him up and make him dig his own grave. and It's terrible, the torture they put him through. Yeah, and they hang that other guy upside down. And like, Or was that him? No, they hang him upside down, too, I think. Yeah, I think they hang both of them upside down at some point. Oh, it's crazy. Um, but yeah. So they discover semen on one of the bodies. But because of Korea's lack of DNA analysis technology... The sample is sent to the United States to confirm if suspect Sean Gu is the killer. That night, a young girl is killed, and at the crime scene, So recognizes the girl as the same schoolgirl that he befriended while investigating earlier in the film. Enraged, he attacks Sean Gu until he is interrupted by Park bringing the results from America. The sample does not match Sean Gu's DNA, and Park has to let Sean Gu go. Now, we're in 2003, and the re- crime remains unsolved, and Park is now a father and a businessman, having left the police force. He happens to pass by the site of the first crime scene, and decides to visit it, learning from a little girl that the scene had recently been visited by an unknown man with a normal face. Someone who looked very ordinary. The little girl had asked the man, why he was looking at the ditch. And the man had responded that he was reminiscing about something he had done there a long time ago. The film ends... <sighs> yeah, it's creepy as fuck. Uh, the film ends as Park, realizing the truth, looks straight at the camera, seemingly using his eye method contact to spot the killer among the audience. And that's the movie. I liked it. Me too. Um, I find that I haven't watched a single movie of Bong Joon-ho's that I haven't liked. And I've seen every one of his movies except for the first one, uh, which is Barking Dog Never Bites. I haven't seen that one because I'm weary to watch it because I know it's about a dude that like kidnaps a barking neighborhood dog that he doesn't like and like kills some dogs or something. Oh my god. Yeah, that's like the whole plot of the movie, and I don't really want to watch it. Yeah, I don't want to watch all the dogs die. No, I'm not. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Unless not... it's all dogs go to heaven, then I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm a little weary of that film, but I hear it's good, actually, so I don't know. I might, I might put myself through that torture. I'll get into it later, but I have been on a spree of watching, um, notoriously depressing films that you can't watch more than once. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing that this past week. Um, what? At all the um, Dark Mirror? What? Black. God damn it. Mirror? Black Mirror? <laughs> black Mirror. always called Dark Mirror. <laughs> like all the Black Mirror episodes in a row. Like depressing. 
that um, one. I think I, I I like some of Black Mirror's episodes. I don't think they're all super depressing. Yeah, but you can't watch them all in the one day. I guess that's true. Um, some of them would be more depressing to watch back to back than others, for sure. Um, yeah, I would say in some ways this is a heavier undertaking, given given um, some of the directors that I've been digging into. I'll give you a hint. I've watched some things by Lars von Trier and some things by Michael Haneke this week. So, um, Trier. I don't know those guys. <laughs> oh, Morgan. Oh, Morgan. <laughs> you don't so know the history that you're missing. Maybe. Oh. Uh, yeah. Know? Yeah, I do. Like, okay. Do yeah, the Antichrist. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Genital mutilation, yay! Yeah, I haven't seen Nymphomaniac or Melancholia or... Uh, I've Melancholia only seen... Melancholia is really good. Um, and the one with Bjork, Dancer in the Dark, is also fantastic. It makes you... You're... It runs the gamut of emotions. It makes you angry, like violently angry. It makes you sad as fuck. It makes you have moments of hope, but not very many. <laughs> oh. So should I watch it? <clears throat> I absolutely recommend watching it. I doubt you'll ever want to watch it again after you see it one time, though. Okay. I'm putting this on my list. It's emotionally devastating. Nice. I need that. Yeah, it's emotionally devastating. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll talk about more emotionally devastating movies at the end of the film. I mean, the end of the episode. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you some production facts and stuff about the movie. Um, so in order to make his character, Detective So, look properly worn out by the stress of the case, actor Kim Sang-kyung uh, deliberately limited his food intake and slept fewer hours than normal. Damn. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore, but not quite Christian Bale and the machine. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> I don't think anything will beat that. <laughs> I hope yeah. not. <laughs> I think I think that is the epitome of method acting is yeah. Christian, Christian Bale and the machinist. <laughs> Okay, so uh, director Quentin Tarantino named it, along with Bong's The Host from 2006, as one of his top 20 favorite movies since 1992. So Quentin Tarantino loves this movie. Which is not shocking if you've seen any Tarant- Tarantino movies, I think. Yeah. I, I would imagine he'd like this director. Yeah. Uh... It's only been like one, it's only been like two episodes since we last talked about Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so Bong Jun ho has stated that the script for Memories of Murder was directly influenced by Alan Moore's comic book From Hell, and that he was also a bit disappointed with the Hughes Brothers film adaptation of it. Uh, we will definitely cover Jack the Ripper at some point, and it'll probably be a two-parter covering this film and some other film, I imagine. Uh, what do you think, Morgan? What about it? What about? <laughs> do you think that we'll definitely cover Jack the Ripper at some point? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I Girl, think you so. It. Are you are you in there? I just zoned out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was thinking about Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. He was on uh, Real Time with Bill Maher like a week or two ago, I think. That still exists. That's still true. Yeah. Yeah. It's been on since like 2002. Yeah, I didn't know it was still on. Yeah, probably still on. Uh, I don't have TV, TV, like cable TV, so. Me neither. I watch or it. HBO. I or... watch it on HBO now. Yeah, I don't have HBO. Now or go or any of the HBOs. You should get in on that. It's a good time. I know Andrew and I like prestige television. Yeah, it was it was right after um, Game of Thrones end, and he was like, "Fuck this! I'm not paying for it." And just (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
don't say yeah. They have a lot more things besides that. I know, and they have all of their old collections and everything, like Angels in America. What? Really? They don't have Tales from the Crypt. Is that on HBO? It was. I did not know that. Yeah, it was one of HBO's, like, first successful shows. I never knew it was on HBO, because I grew up watching that. Yeah, on HBO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. No, but... They do have Angels in America, which was a mini series. Oh, I highly recommend it. So uh, I have indeed seen that, although it has been many moons. Yes, it's so good. Totally. So good. Totally. Okay. Um, so one deleted scene shows Detective Cho walking in a, a red light district. And then getting a massage from a girl as he asks her about possible leads regarding the murders. And the scene was shot in a real-life red light district, and they had to ask the local pimp for permission to film. <laughs> what? Yep. That's crazy. So it was like a real um, lady of the night? Sex um, worker? Not massaging him, I don't think. But I don't know for sure. But yes, <laughs> they were in a real red light district. And wow. The pimp was a real room. massage parlor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when Quang Ho was interrogated in the basement of the police station, the two police officers and the suspect watched a TV program while eating their meals. The title of this program is So San Ban Jang, which can be loosely interpreted as Investigation Squad in English. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a famous TV detective drama which aired for almost 20 years. Oh, they're watching, like, a detective show. Yeah, that had been on, like, Law and Order long. And uh, the opening music was also very popular during that era. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So, uh, Lee Chun, Jay, has said of the film, I watched, and that's the killer, by the way. <laughs> that's his name, Lee Chun, Jay. He has said of the film, I watched it as a movie. I had no feelings or emotions related to it. Spoken like a true serial killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, right? Uh, I have no emotions. <laughs> I am a robot. <laughs> or he could also be interpreted as one of my ex-boyfriends. Anyone who knows me knows the one. <laughs> <laughs> huh, anyway. Uh... So this film is in the official top 250 narrative feature films on Letterboxd. Uh, it is the, fin um, oh, the final scene where Park is staring into the audience as if to see the killer's face. It was written because Bong was confident that the killer would watch this film. Uh, and as previously mentioned, he was correct. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Um, so this film is part of the Criterion Collection, spine number 1073. Uh, by, the will, uh, by the way, I will be uh, mentioning Criterion in greater detail, because uh, all those depressing movies I've been watching were on the Criterion channel. <laughs> I have their uh, two-week free trial right now, and I am getting my money's worth. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so the letter from the FBI about the semen DNA testing is signed by director Clarence M. Kelly, but Kelly was the director from 1973 to 1978. William H. Webster was the director in 1986. So mm. that was that was an error. Also, Damn. The, yeah. Also, the FBI letter contains four spelling errors. <laughs> it has. It has examination instead of examination. It has instrumental instead of instrumental. It has dated instead of dated. <laughs> and October. October. Instead of, instead of October. That's the new, the new yeah. month. <laughs> October. <Yeah>. October. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, several characters are seen wearing white iPod style earbuds. Earbuds, this style didn't exist until 2001. So, 
that's an anachronism. <laughs> uh, the scene where one detective is in focus and asks, have you ever seen anything like that? And then the focus changes to the second detective who answers never is an homage shot to 1995-7. And rightly so, because David Fincher is bae. <laughs> <laughs> I have the utmost respect for that man's craft, plus he directed my favorite movie, Fight Club. Seriously, I chant, his name is Robert Paulson. His name is Robert <laughs> Paulson. Like, at least once a day. <laughs> um, I'll burn the homage train because Fincher pays homage to Memories of Murder in 2007's Zodiac. Yeah. There's, a line, there's a line where a kid refers to the Zodiac killer as looking normal. Yeah, and this case was the Korean Zodiac. Yes, he was. That's true. That's his uh, other nickname that the press gave him. Because, you know, it was unsolved for a long time. But now it is solved. Which, I don't know if our Zodiac will ever be solved. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that's going to be a secret that someone took to their grave, unfortunately. Unless the, uh, D- well, the DNA wasn't ever really... They don't have any DNA, right? Mm, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and everybody that worked the case that retired literally took evidence to, like, keep at their home. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to retire. I'm just going to steal this out of the evidence uh, room. <laughs> just, just ruin vital evidence to, uh, you know, like, insanely famous cold case. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, shall we take a commercial break before you, uh... Yeah. And I... About this crazy serial killer? I also will compliment you, because this, this one was really well done about all the backstory shit, man. I just yeah. wanted to compliment you. And uh, I bet our listeners will compliment you as well. That's really, really great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Really great job. <laughs> okay, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Anastasia for Anchor Podcasts. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or a computer. Who doesn't like that? Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And we're back. Back in action. Back a cow. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Morgan. Tell us about the Hossong murders. The Hossong murders are mm. crazy, and this whole story is just cray cray. Um, cray cray, indeed. So the Hossong murders. Uh, took place from September 15, 1986 to April 3, 1991. Um, and they were unsolved until last year. Um, actually, 2019 is when they announced another suspect. Um, but it wasn't until, like, 2020, I think, that um, it, it really came song. out. Yeah. Um so we'll start with the actual murder and then just go around um, and talk about the other um, suspects too that were falsely accused. Or one suspect was falsely accused, but many suspects existed. Um, so Lee Chun J, is it J? 
I think you pronounce it J. Uh, Lin Chu J is the South Korean serial killer, also known as the South Korean Zodiac killer. Um, this was really the first South Korean serial killer that had been like exposed, I guess. Um, it was the only, it was the first case that had the same modus operandi um, of the bound rape and kill, um, which all of the victims were. Mm -hmm. um, bound, raped, and killed. Mostly bound with um, rope or parts of their clothing, uh, like stockings, bras, panties. Um, uh, and many of those items were also found stuffed in the victim's mouth as well. Um, so they were all, it was all like the same type of killing. Um, but they were like, the, like the movie shows, the police really didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Um, yeah. When it first started, um, with the uh, first rape and murder, the first victim was Lee Wam In, and she was a 71-year-old woman who was out um, walking home after visiting her daughter. And she was found in a pasture like four days later. Um, and then a month later, Park Hyun Sook, uh, 25, she had gotten off of a bus and she was supposed to go home um, and never made it home. And she wasn't found until three days later in a canal. And after these two murders, they're like, OK, this is like the same trait like they had the same type of ties tied around them. They were both raped. And then, so they called all the police officers like in South Korea, I swear. It was 2 million police officers um, were mobilized during these investigations. Um, and it says police officers involved spent 2 million man days on the case and the number of suspects over these years, which, what is it, four, five years, almost five years, um, they had 21,280 suspects or individuals that they um, questioned. And there were also 40,116 people had their fingerprints taken and 570 DNA samples were taken. So there was a lot. Like, that's why I think it was just such a, a mess. Because um, the first five murders happened. Uh, it's a... Hey Song or Ha Song is a uh, county outside of Seoul, the capital, and this area is like farms, um, farmland, rice paddies, uh, some hills with trees, like forests. So it's pretty rural, and there's no street lights. Um, so after these first few murders, um, women were scared to go out after dark. Uh, especially not wearing red or in the rain. They didn't want to get caught because there was that rumor went around like in the movie that um, when it rains and if the woman's wearing red, the killer will attack you. So people quit wearing red, um, quit going outside when it rained, just trying to get away and not be the next in the killer's grip. It's like um, when women were dyeing their hair blonde during the Ted Bundy killings. Oh, yeah. 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 It totally, like, changed that area. Yeah. And changed the style. No red. Um, but there are actually police officers. The, the female police officers would wear red and go out in the rain to try to lure the killer. Yeah. Um didn't work and also they would put out police officers every like 400 feet or so um, in the woods or in the rice paddies and 
when it would rain so they would all be like laying down but um this didn't work and someone else was murdered um away from the police so they saw the police trying this and they're like well i'm gonna go over here and kill people instead um so everything that they tried was like not working um and also they were doing like abusive investigations into these people um they would waterboard them with like we said earlier with hot spicy seafood soup oh my god which is terrible <laughs> um all of them were uh like all of the suspects were submitted to police brutality um and the one who did eventually confess um, he confessed as a copycat killer who actually was the real killer's victim, um, just because it didn't match the other crimes. They thought, oh yeah, we got it, you know, like we got him. This is, this is a copycat murder, but it was actually, um, done by, uh, Lee. Um, but they got him, they got this other guy, uh, on sept it was the murder that happened september 16th 1988 it was the eighth killing um it was actually considered to be a copycat murder which is not true um it was of a 13 year old girl who was sleeping and um someone climbed the fence murdered and raped her in her bed um so they thought this was a copycat or something and they ended up arresting this man who was a 22 year old repairman. And um, they kept him for three days in a basement while like feeding him and withholding food, waterboarding him. Um, and he ended up confessing, um, of course, cause he'd been like kept in a basement for three days. Um, and he said he had the urge to rape and climbed up the house and raped the girl. But this guy had polio and had a really terrible limp. So like he couldn't climb this house cause it was really high. Um, yet they convicted him. They um, uh, put him to jail, put him in jail for 20 years. And he actually served 20 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. He got out in 2009 and it wasn't until 2019 that DNA said, Hey, wait, this guy didn't do it. Um, so he is currently battling, um, like a retrial or something, um, with South Korea. And all the police officers that were in on that investigation actually have apologized, including the judge. But some of them are now, I think seven officers are being brought to court now for the abuse in that case of the, the once called murder. So he had nothing to do with it. He just got snatched up and right. then was convicted. Um, it's really sad. He served 20 fucking years. Um, so all of these killings like took place pretty close. Um, the, all the, the first ones, the first five took place within like the same, uh, two mile distance. Um, and then the latter ones, after the police got involved and tried to set out traps and everything, moved away from uh, Hasong. Um, so it, it just kept moving further and further away from the point where he had first started. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they were within like the first 3.7 miles. And then after that, it was like five to ten miles away something like that um and then after this guy was convicted in 88 this this killings actually stopped for like a year and a half um 
and it wasn't until November 15th, 1990, that the ninth victim uh, was found. Um, and it's the same story. She was um, tied up and raped um, and murdered and left in a field, I believe. Um, so, I mean, everybody was freaking out at this time. Um, there was one survivor um, that had described the killer. Or, no, sorry. It was one bus driver that described the killer um, of one of the, it was the seventh victim. She got out of the bus and another man got on the bus right after the murder, um, September 7th, 1988. And it was like around this area. Um, so he remembered what he looked like. And he said, he said he had soft hands. Um, sorry, I'm getting all this like mixed up. Uh, he said he looked normal and didn't have double eyelids. He was about 170 centimeters tall in his mid twenties. And he had a short cut sporty type hair and a sharp nose. Um, and some of the victims were describing, did describe him that he had soft hands, but I couldn't find any living victim testimony um, about the killer. Right. Uh, a lot of this is like kept secret um, with South Korean law, like victims or um, like like people who are accused of a crime, they blur out their face now and take their names down from like everything. Um, but in the U.S., it's a lot different. They'll say victims' names sometimes, even though when they're not supposed to. We'll um, gladly ruin your life. Yeah, yeah. So in South Korea, it's really like the victims um, are kept secret, especially the family members, too. Even when the family members come out and speak, they're, they're all uh, blurred and their names are redacted from all testimony. Um, right, so there's not so, a media circus around them. Yeah, exactly. So after this... Um, what is it? It was it was November fifteenth, nineteen ninety. That was uh, the two year hiatus. Um, it was a middle schooler. She was only fourteen, um, and she was found with her hands and feet tied, strangled, gagged with her bra, and she had a ballpoint pen, a fork, and a spoon, I believe, in her vagina. Um, and she also had uh, semen found at the the uh, scene of the crime yeah so this guy like uh, um the movie showed the seventh victim had peach slices in her vagina as well um he like so the movie weird. like he pulled, i know he'd like pull out a like in that scene he had that case with the pen some peaches or it wasn't peaches it was a pen a fork and mm -hmm. a razor blade. Yeah. Um, he, he would mutilate them afterwards and then stick those inside of the victims. Um, and not all of them were mutilated. Um, yeah. But later, there was a lot of um, things found inside the victims' bodies in their vaginas. Um, but... This guy actually committed more murders than what's known, but they have not released the names of the victims or the dates or anything. But uh, Lee did confess to 14, but there's only 10 that are listed. Um, so he actually killed more, and they think he may have even killed more than that because they're not sure. Um, but I will say Lee start or er, was caught early 
clear than his confession and was already in prison when he confessed. Um, yeah. In 1994, his wife had left him because he was married. His wife left him in, in December 1993. And by January 13th, 1994, he invited his sister-in-law, which was his wife's sister. He invited his sister-in-law over where he drugged raped and then murdered her and he even went to his father-in-law's house and said he would join in the search for her and was like searching for her body when actual he fucking killed um his sister-in-law and like a classic her lifetime body. movie move yeah you know he like I mean? yeah it, it definitely is. <laughs> I'm a concerned citizen. I know exactly where her body is, but I'm not going to tell you. But I'm a concerned citizen. Concerned citizen. <laughs> He's like, maybe this will get my wife back. <laughs> I know. Actually, it's more like, oh, I can revel in this crime and watching all these people be frantic and sad. And I can feed, like, the insidious source that I am off of this. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's crazy that they got him for this, though. Because yeah. he denied it until police brutality. <laughs> oh. Yeah. He, yeah. Um, he tried to overturn his confession because the police brutality, but then he was con uh, convicted and sentenced to death in May 1994. And then 1995, the Supreme Court reviewed the case and reduced his sentence to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole until 20 years. So it wasn't until September 19. Uh, 2019 that he was even identified for the Hassan murders. Um, the DNA from one of the victims uh, underwears matched his DNA and then he denied it until around October he um, confessed to murdering 15 um, but there's only like 14 or I think he, he did more um 14 or that that they know of but he confessed confessed to 15 um but he also confessed to over 30 rapes and attempted rapes um so he'd like been that. going for yeah for a for a while like um, uh the golden and, state killer started just being as just as rapist and then he escalated yeah i i think he may have done more um yeah there's no way of knowing because he's not really one to talk. Um, so he actually, uh, he was linked to four of them beforehand uh, or three. I don't, I don't remember how many. I read it on some other article. He was linked to a few and actually had been uh, questioned by the police several times. Um because a lot of the same people are in this town. There's only like 100,000 people in this town at this time. So yeah, it's, kind it's of like a little bit smaller small. than like Syracuse. Yeah. So a lot of the same men were getting questioned over and over because uh, they lived in the same area and worked in the same places and stuff. So they actually pulled him in for questioning several times and he would try to tell them about himself, but they were more interested in his neighbors and his coworkers. So he never confessed, and he wasn't really labeled as a suspect before. Uh, he was just like a person of interest, sort of, like to give more details about other people that were the, um, the whatever uh, right. person they're looking at. Um, cause they torture a lot of people, oh, yeah. uh, the police torture a lot of people. Um, and it, if it wasn't for him just being like super crazy and going out and raping and murdering his own sister-in-law, he may not have been caught for a lot longer. Yeah. 
Oh, well, you know, they're they're always their own uh, downfall usually. Yeah, you get I a little just... sloppy towards the end. I there's a quote by Ted Bundy that's great that talks about that. Um, I can't remember what it is exactly. Oh, oh the I... wrench or a screw yeah. or something. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, like the fifteenth time you'll be like, "What?" Yeah, I don't remember it. I'm totally butchering it. <laughs> I know. Are you googling it? I am googling it. <laughs> uh, you learn what you need to kill and take care of the details. It's like changing a tire. The first time you're careful, by the thirtieth, you can't remember where you left the lug wrench. Yeah, the lug wrench. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, so he definitely got, like, really sloppy during the end, like, the the last few. Um, but he did have a hiatus. But, you know, we don't know if he actually had a hiatus because 1991 um, through 1994, um, there were only, like, two. But in his he was killing multiple and one uh, each year. Yeah. So 92 and 93, there weren't anybody um, anybody that he confessed to. So um, I think that's where the other five that he confessed to come in. I, uh, I agree. Yeah, so he's currently in prison. Um, he wasn't able to be convicted of these murders because the statute of limitations, which is only 15 years, ran out on murder. Yeah, um, that's crazy. Yeah, so he couldn't actually be convicted of this crime. Like, all the crimes that he committed to and were linked to, he can't actually be um, um, convicted of because in South Korea... They have a 15-year statute of limitations, and that has run out. So he was actually up for parole for the other murder, but he wants to stay in prison because um, other murders that have been let out have received death threats, um, have been abused, um, have to move all the time. And he said he would feel more comfortable being in prison. Yeah, he knows that the most comfortable life that he can have at this point is to just stay in jail. Yeah. Seriously. Because, I mean, if he was to get out, he would definitely be, he would probably be murdered. Probably. Because all of these people, these families, it didn't happen that long ago, so there's people still alive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, with his, like, level of fame like how famous this case is it would be like if ted bundy didn't get fried and instead just got out suddenly yeah you you, there's no way you'd be able to lead a life (laughs) like it but i guess the um i guess yeah i don't i was just bringing up casey anthony (laughs) You know, most people think she's guilty, but I mean, there's clearly people who still like associate with her. Yeah, I know. I Crazy. I uh, I'm glad that no, none of the reality TV shows that she was in the talks with ever went through. I'm glad too. Like I, I, I can't. I like hearing she gets drinks thrown in her face. <laughs> she does, yes. Uh, 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 she's terrible. So, Mo, have you uh, have you watched anything in the past yes. couple of weeks? Anything interesting? Anything good? Yeah, there's this uh, this show that Andrew and I have been watching. Huh? Uh, it's on Apple. TV? Do you have Apple TV? Okay. Do you have Apple TV? I do not have Apple TV. Oh. Well, there's a comedy series 
uh, called Mythic Quest. Oh, I know of this. It's uh, Rob McElhenney from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, they're like at a video game company, and um, it's like a workplace comedy, right? Yeah, it's yeah. actually pretty good. I like it. I thought it would be good just because I've been watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia for like 14 years. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I, I trust them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like it. I just started watching it last night. So that's what I've been watching. Okay. Um, I don't want to give Apple money. I know. <laughs> We're using someone else's account. <laughs> Got it. We're not paying for it. I'm going to have to Thank acquire... You, I'm going to have to acquire, <laughs> acquire someone's info myself mm -hmm. to uh, see that. I also want to watch Ted Lasso. Yeah, Andrew's been watching that. Uh, I don't watch that one. <laughs> I have not watched that one. Fair enough. Um, I hear good things, and I like uh, UK football. So, fair enough. Um, so, is that all you've been watching? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. I don't even remember what I ate yesterday, so it's kind of hard to tell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. So here's what I've been up to. This isn't the first time I've done this in my life. I go through binges of watching really depressing shit. I don't know why, but I do. Um, and it's never... What's weird is it's never when I'm sad that I do this. Because you know some people, when they're sad or depressed, they just want to delve deeper into the sadness. Yeah. I, that's not how I do it. I, like, will listen to sad music and watch really depressing movies during the summer when I feel like I'm happier emotionally and I'm not having seasonal affective disorder <laughs> so that I don't, like, kill myself. Yeah, so you don't go... <laughs> it's a balance. Sorry. Oh, my God, it's easy. So you don't go deeper, deeper into depression. You you no, just kind of like it's a balance. You know. It's a yin and yang situation. That's how I handle yeah. it. <laughs> so you know, I can listen to Joni Mitchell like in the summer, <laughs> and then you know, listen to like um, I don't know Madonna in the winter. That's <laughs> I don't listen to Madonna, really, but you I get what like, I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know. Um, MGMT. Something happy and dancey. <laughs> I don't know. What about Third Eye Blind? All about meth. Dude, dude. No. Uh, I, I just <laughs> went straight into semi charm Life. Um, but yeah, no. I, uh, I like Third Eye Blind. I like how a lot of their music is actually depressing, but sounds chipper. Yeah, like they're like uh, the song you were just singing is all about crystal meth. I know. <laughs> and uh, you know, the jumpers about suicide. It's a it's a good album actually. Yeah, it really is. And then the the last one um, on that album, like the one I had was the instrumental version, but the real version, <gasps> slow motion, is fucking. <laughs> that one is real real dark let me tell you how i first heard about slow motion me <laughs> no 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 much younger than that um i was in fifth grade on the gifted program field trip and my friend lauren who sat behind me was listening to her like walkman and yeah. <laughs> she was listening to that song and she, oh told me the, she told me the lyrics, and I was like, we're 11. <laughs> <laughs> we should not know these things. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty young. I think yeah. I was in, like, 6th or 7th grade when I, when I first heard it. Yeah. Lauren, Lauren was the bad influence. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but Third Eye Blinds, they're fun. I like them. I like Third Eye Blind. So what depressing movies have okay. you Okay, so it, 
first we need to go back in time to September Ooh. September 2007. That's a long time ago. Yeah. I don't know if I can go back that far. So it's late. It's September 28th, 2007 at curiously 4:20 p.m. and a a uh, a list has just been posted to the AV club and it's called not again 24 great films too painful to watch twice and at this point in my life i religiously surfed the AV club website so I see this title and it's catnip because, uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm still obviously a cinephile, but at that time in my life, I was very voracious because I was just taking so many films in that I hadn't seen. And I was just binging shit, system overload all the time. <laughs> So I saw this list and um, I started working my way through it. Uh, any ones that I hadn't already watched. Um, so it has like Requiem for a Dream on there. Dancer in the Dark, which I was talking about earlier. Uh, the Passion of Joan of Arc, which is like a silent film. And then I can't. I, I, by the way, I re-pulled this list back up um, this past week. So it was really written in 2007. Yeah, it was written in 2007. I pulled the list back up this week to see what I hadn't watched back then on the list. Because I knew I hadn't finished the list. And I realized that I hadn't seen Michael Haneke's The Seventh Continent. And now I could be pronouncing his last name wrong. I know he's Austrian. Um, I don't know if it's Hanek or Haneke, whatever. It's, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but The Seventh Continent came out in 1989. And spoiler alerts for The Seventh Continent. Um, so, I had seen stuff by Michael Haneke before. He directed Funny Games. Do you know Funny Games? Yeah. So, yeah. Funny Games is a fucked up movie. All of his movies are like that. They're all fucked up. Like they're psychological. All, they're all extremely nihilistic. There's no hope. There's never any hope in his films, I feel like. Oh, he did the piano teacher too. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The man <laughs> The man doesn't make happy movies. Uh just like I say Lars von Trier doesn't make happy movies. Um they make difficult controversial films and um so that that's why i've delved into them quite a bit because when you're a cinephile or you're a fan of like extreme cinema i guess you would say it starts to become a dare between you and your friends to watch in either increasingly shocking films or increasingly depressing films. <laughs> um, and I guess Who's I'm gonna at, kill themselves first. <laughs> I guess. Uh, so I've been on this battle with different uh, fellow cinephiles for a while, I guess, pushing ourselves to the limits. The last time I did one of these binges, it's been quite a while, actually. It was back in um, 2014. And that's when I watched Serbian film for the first time. Uh, I say for the first time, it's the only time I've watched yeah, it. <laughs> it's not like I'm trying to watch that again, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so The Seventh Continent is super mundane and banal for the most part. Like the first three quarters is just um, this family going through the motions, like going to school and you don't see hardly any emotion. Like the second half, not half, I guess like the second third of the film, they're going through a car wash and you see the mom just like silently start crying. And then she has like a gasping sound or whatever. And that's some emotion you actually see. <clears throat> you also see her slap her daughter like towards the earlier part in the earlier part of the movie towards the beginning because her daughter pretended to be blind at school for some reason 
Hmm. So, like, you only see really small acts of actual emotion. It's a lot of them sitting around the table, eating, watching TV, just doing, like, again, yeah, just going through the motions, doing really banal things. And, um, you, throughout the narrative, you see them, like, writing letters to, um, the father's mother. Uh, so the first letter is just like talking about work, getting promotions, shit like that. Just really stupid, normal stuff. And then the next letter that they write, um, it's the husband writing. It's usually the, w- the wife writing. The next one's the husband writing to his mom being like, see, I can write you letters. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, after we left your house to visit you the last time I quit my job. Um, and it's just going to be for the better. I just, I don't want to work there anymore. And, uh, that's just what's going down and it kind of pauses. And then you see them going to the bank and withdrawing all their money out of the bank. Uh, uh, and they tell the, uh, bank teller that they're going to immigrate to Australia from Austria. Um, and you keep, and there's also like a motif of you keep seeing this like tourism poster for Australia and the beaches. So you keep seeing that kind of throughout the film. And um, so they write a letter to the school. They're the, the wife calls the school and says that their daughter is not going to be returning to school for a while. She's going to be out for a while. And, um, then you see them go to the hardware store and they get a bunch of power tools and a series of hammers and things. Oh, shit. And then you see them go to the grocery store and they buy a bunch of like really decadent, expensive food. And they like all pig out together happily. And then uh, it goes back to the letter and it's like, you know, we debated whether or not we should take um, our, you know, the daughter with us or not or leave her with you. But we talked to her about it, and she doesn't want to be separated from us. And, you know, she understands what it all means. So, it's like, you know, she's going to come with us. And um, that's that. And that's, you know, more into the letter to the mother-in-law. And then um, if after they eat that big meal, it shows them um, putting, like, sturdy shoes on and gloves and stuff. And then they just start destroying all their shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, they just, like, breaking records in half, ripping pages out of books, um, undoing seams and buttons out of clothes, tearing things in shreds, just, like, destroying their shit. And then, um, you see it throughout the movie, they had this giant-ass, like, probably 30-gallon fish tank, right? Maybe maybe more than that, maybe 50-gallon, it's a huge fish tank. And, um... The dad takes a sledgehammer to it. And then it's the first time you see emotion again. The daughter starts screaming, crying. Because, you know, her fish have just fallen in the cascade of water onto the ground. And are flapping desperately for the last bit of, you know, oxygen that they can't get into their gills. Because they're not in water. And they're so... Yeah, and they're dying on the floor. And she's bursting into tears and the dad just kind of looks at her and he's like I'm sorry like he got too carried away with destroying things and didn't think about what that would be like for his daughter I guess and um it shows like extreme close ups of the fish flopping and Ugh. just you know fear and their la- the yes and their the last fear. throes of life and this was like to me, the most upsetting part of the film. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, it's so upsetting. I, what did those fish do? <laughs> <clears throat> and then the father um, and mother, uh, they're like brushing their teeth for bed and they've like destroyed every TV except for just one in the back bedroom. Or I guess the, the master bedroom, their bedroom. And you see uh, the wife come from out of the bathroom and she hands the daughter a drink 
And the daughter takes a sip out of it, and then she kind of lays down to go to bed. And then um, you see the wife go back to the bathroom, and then she crushes up a bunch of pills in a cup and, uh, like, throws it back. And, you know, you can tell it's nasty, bitter tasting. Has a hard, She has a hard time drinking it. And then she goes and uh, drinks some champagne and uh, finishes that. And uh, then she goes and, like, starts crying over her daughter's uh, body. And uh, then just kind of, like, passes out. And then you see the husband um, go to the bathroom and also crush up some pills. But then he doesn't quite finish and he pukes up it up. So then he has to put it in a syringe and um, inject it into himself. And then... You see him sitting up straight, eyes glazed over, uh, wide open with, like, dried foam around his mouth, and clearly dead. Oh, my and, God. Uh, and, yeah, and the TV is just on, like, static, like, the channel's gone out, and it just, like, starts panning to the TV, and it just zooms into that static. And then it's over. What the fuck? Yeah. I'm more depressed than I was before we started this call. I- I'm sorry about <laughs> that. I had to I had to spread it. I didn't even watch it. <laughs> um I'm a- I think I told it pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I kinda wanna watch it. <laughs> it's on Criterion channel. Um, it's at times boring, extremely depressing, um, but I recommend it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, it's an experience that I think should be experienced at least once. And, uh, but if you're the type of person who would be just devastated by this completely and don't think you could handle it, then, um, don't do that. Then don't do that. (laughs) But um, if you're a masochist cinephile like myself, then dive right in. It's right. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I also started watching. I'm not going to tell the whole movie of this one, but I also started watching um, Safe uh, by Todd Haynes that came out in like 94. It stars Julianne Moore as like this bored, rich housewife that has just such an empty, vacant, depressing life. And because she has everything she wants, but, you know, like, that's so empty. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, she starts, uh, safe. It's called safe. Safe. She starts slowly, like, being super irritated by small chemical things, like, nearly choking to death by just being behind a truck with, like, a pretty normal amount of exhaust and, like, uh, getting rashes and not being and like having like asthma attacks around like small cleaning products and stuff. It's apparently a real medical symptom um, er, that doctors like heavily debate whether or not it's like real. Was it pots? No, it's called. Um, it's not postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. No, it's referred to as. An environmental illness in the film, but it's, uh, I forget what Todd Haynes referred to it as. I think he said it was, like, um, acute chemical something or other. But basically, doctors either think that you're either actually really, really sensitive to small amounts of chemicals that other people wouldn't even notice, or... You're crazy. Oh. <laughs> not, not, okay, not crazy, but you have something wrong um, Men- mentally going on up there, and, um, yeah. So, it was uncomfortable, but I ultimately found it just to be really boring. Like it what like I never felt like there was this shock value, and it's co- it's considered to be a horror film of sorts because like sh- you know her environment is slowly attacking her, 
And it did feel claustrophobic, but I don't know. It was just boring, uncomfortable, in my opinion. Is this the one with Julianne Moore? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she's really good in it, but yeah, I just, I couldn't. Um, I think that's kind of all I did. What else did I do? Oh, I watched The Little Things on HBO Max. Oh, how's that? It was good. I liked it. Um, Jared Leto is a super creep in it. <laughs> um, it's the creepiest role I've ever seen him in. Uh, yeah, looking at him made you want to take a shower. <laughs> he's, he's very effectively creepy in this movie. Oh, I want to see it. I don't have HBO though. Um, I don't know. You might be able to like Maybe rent she... it on Amazon or something. Mm. Or, oh, you can watch it on Hulu. Oh, or you can watch it on Hulu. Watch it there. Yeah. Ah. Well. You reminded me of a really depressing movie that I never want to watch again, but I, I kind of want to watch it again just because it's been so long. What's but that? it came out in 2005. Um, okay. It's called Sometimes in April, and it's actually based on um, the Hutus and Tootsies in Rwanda. Oh. And it, oh. Fall and it has... Um, Idris Elba in it. Um, yeah. And uh, it revolves around... It's a, a Hutu uh, who married a Tootsie, I think. Okay. And his... Oh, it's it's so fucked up. I don't even want to go into it. But it shows, right. like, kids getting killed and stuff. Yeah, but, I imagine so, given the, that particular genocide. Yeah, all the girls they break they bomb into like a girls' school, and it's like I think it's one of Idris Elba's daughters. He's like the only one that survives out of Shit. the whole family. Uh, him and like one girl who hid in a bush for like a month or God. however long it is. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, she they bomb into the all girls' school, yeah. and when they come in, they say who to who's a who to. And I think it's the Tootsies that, yeah, no. So it was Tootsies that bombed it. And they say, who's a uh, Hutu? And they're like, I'm a Tootsie. I don't remember which one. But they okay. end up I, murdering I'm all. not at all belittling this situation. It's a very serious genocide. <laughs> not because there can't be a joking genocide. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. I take this very seriously. However, you got to agree with me here when I say that Hutus and Tootsies sound like a Girl Scout troop. <laughs> right? Sort yeah. of, yeah. Hi, yeah. Right? Hutu, Tootsie. They, they sound cutesy. Like, you know, I think it's like Tootsie Roll. Tootsie Roll? Tootsie Roll? That's what it makes me think of. Yeah, Hutu and Tootsie. But if you say Tootsies and Hutus, it sounds more sinister. You know what? You know what? I, t I, I retract that statement. It sounds like something Dr. Seuss would have done. <laughs> it sounds very Seussical. It does. He, but it was not Seussical at all. Well, ever. I know that, obviously. <laughs> I, again, I take this very seriously. <laughs> but you're right. The names. But Rwanda. How about that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> so for the next episode, um, we're going to be record. We're going to have a guest. I'm not sure which guest's going to be on that episode yet or which movie we're doing yet. There will be another episode, hopefully this month. It might be at the very beginning of August. Uh, yeah. We're sorry. Um, scheduling's been crazy this uh, month. Yes. Uh, but we love you fans. And um, just keep your eyes peeled later in the month. 
Also, we are going to be on the Blood, Guts, and Booze podcast this Sunday. So go check, uh, just go listen to us over on that feed. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I'm so price of admi- The price of admission covers the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. <laughs> <laughs> That's from American Dad. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> I could quote that show all night long. But all right, um, we're going to let you guys go because I am, for one, losing my voice um, a little bit. And for two, we've been recording for a long time now. Yeah, very long time. Very long time. Yeah, we had some technical difficulties and it was a blast. Thank you, big boxed internet company that really sucks you dry. Yeah. <laughs> you suck. You dicks. Yeah. Uh, no names, but no names. You're a big chain, and there's only so many in the country. Yeah, so you can figure out which one it is. False. <laughs> they all suck. They all suck. Yeah. So whichever one you think it is, it probably is, or it isn't. But they still suck. Yes. Exactly. All right. Um. Bye. Bye. bye.